Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you so very much for listening. A bit of an amended podcast intro this week. Uh, I'm in the barn all alone. Clay's daughter, Catherine, recently returned from England to celebrate the holidays with her father. This week's show is a retrospective, a look back at some of our favorite conversations from 2021, and it's a difficult choice. There are so many, and I'm certain I've left some favorites out, but we hope you enjoy it. And I think it's appropriate to thank all of the Jefferson Hour contributors one more time, and not just the people that were on the show, but those of you who listen, who write to us, who support the show in whatever way you can. I will never take that for granted. So thank you. And if you're new to the Jefferson Hour and you want to find out more, go to jeffersonhour.com. There's a lot of information and past work there. And you can also use that as a portal to email President Jefferson or Clay Jenkinson with your questions. And you can support the show by clicking on Donate. And we really do appreciate that. So we're going to go to the show in just a minute. But before we do, I have to take just a minute and thank those of you who sent us holiday greetings. Um, and I'm sure I'll miss somebody from the list, but James the Peanuts from Virginia are pretty special. And Deanna, consider the fork. That was a good one. Then there's Mr. Webb from England. That was such a wonderful letter to get. You didn't leave a return address on there, but I'd sure like to keep in touch with you. And thanks so much for sending the syllabus about uh, Native American studies. And um, it was just great to hear from you. And what a beautiful letter. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, let's go to the show. A retrospective. Happy New Year 2021. Good day, citizens, and welcome to this week's episode of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. And first, a happy new year to all. This week, a retrospective show as we look back on some of our favorite conversations from 2021. But before we begin, we must take a moment to thank all of the gracious contributors to the show during this past year. I think of Pat Brodowski, David DeCandry, Bo Wright, Brad Crisler, and of course, Lindsay Chervinsky and Joseph Ellis. The Jefferson Hour is a public radio program and a podcast that attempts to look at the world around us through the lens of the humanities and American history and literature. That's what we do. And we try to take Jefferson and what Jefferson stood for in the world that Jefferson lived in and project it forward to give us clarity and context, a kind of a matrix that maybe allows us to understand the bewildering things around us better. We started 2021 with an episode titled Transition. Recorded on January 7th, we discussed the events of January 6th. Let me start this way. This is the first time since 1814 that the United States Capitol has been assaulted. It was attacked by the British, and the city of Washington was burned. This time, the second time in American history that this has happened, the attack was by our own citizens. Jefferson might call them rebels. So that's pretty sobering that this happened yesterday, and I sat in complete disbelief. And in the long run, the actual attack, the physical attack on the Capitol building will be more symbolic than meaningful. The meaningful part of this was the the breakdown of our constitutional republic that has precipitated a moment like January 6th, 2021. You mentioned Mitch McConnell's speech. I know both of us listened to a great number of the speeches given. McConnell called that speech the most important of his 36 years in the Senate. We're debating a step that has never been taken in American history, whether Congress should overrule the voters and overturn a presidential election. I've served 36 years in the Senate. This will be the most important vote I've ever cast. I think it was the greatest of his political career. And if you closed your eyes or just read a transcript, that speech could have been given by the most eminent law professors at the greatest universities in the United States. It could have been delivered by a, a justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. He did the statesman-like thing 
to suggest that we must have a peaceful transition, we must respect the votes of the American people. And he said that if we don't do that, if Congress refuses simply to do its ceremonial duty and certify the election, that this would bring about what he called a death spiral to America's Republican form of government. He could not have stated it more firmly. You could see the passion that he was trying to control as he spoke those words. It was a brave thing to do. And I think that McConnell's speech would have had a chastening effect even without uh, the crisis that, that sobered everybody up later in the day. And I thought that it would be really interesting for us to check in uh, with Dr. Joseph Ellis because he is as grounded in what the Founding Fathers had in mind and what they feared as anyone. Joe, one of our listeners wrote to me and said, to what extent is Jefferson complicit by all that wild talk about the tree of liberty and I like a little rebellion now and then? Is that streak in our culture in any way located in, in, in that posturing that Jefferson did about rebellion. Yeah, Abigail used to say to him, yeah, it's neat for you to say that when you're in Paris and somebody over in Massachusetts is having their place burned down. Uh, it's a legitimate question, I think. I mean, Jefferson trusted the people to behave themselves and to internalize a sense of uh, honor and obligation to uh, law, which some people regard, including Adams, as naive. Remember what Jefferson said, Joe, you know, all those wild statements, but what he was, what he basically was saying was that the spirit of rebellion, even if irresponsible, it reminds government of the truth that the people are sovereign and it wakes everyone up to the real business of what it is to be free. And so we should be very charitable and not overreact to rebellion, because in a sense, it's always a wake-up call, even when it's done for the wrong reasons. He did think that, and Adams liked to say, where were you when they uh, surrounded my house when I was president? 5,000 people were out there demonstrating, telling me that we had to go to war with France. And he said, no doubt you was fast asleep in philosophic tranquility. Exactly, exactly. We so appreciate Joe Ellis's contributions to this program, and we look forward to hearing from him more in 2022. But as always, when we try to understand our government, we have to listen to Jefferson's voice. Good day to you, my dear citizen. Mr. Jefferson, it is a new year, and I wish you a happy new year, sir. And we have just come from a year of a presidential election. Our next president will be sworn in on January 20th. Recognizing that, I was hoping to speak with you this week about your inauguration on March 4th, 1801. Yes, you've changed the Constitution since my time, and uh, the original um, apparatus set up by the Founding Fathers in Philadelphia in 1787 called for the installation of the new president on the 4th of March. Subsequently, you have amended the Constitution to make that oath of office happen on the 20th day of January. So you've you brought it closer to the time of the election. We lived in a slower world in my era where travel was cumbersome and tedious uh, and not much was at stake. And so we could afford uh, to wait a couple of months after the election before the installation of the next executive. It's reported that your inauguration day was a mild one, I believe 55 degrees. It was the first held in the city of Washington and that you provided the text of your speech to the National Intelligencer newspaper for immediate publication. Oh, that's true. I, well, I knew that I was not a great public speaker. I knew that only a fraction of the people who might be interested in my inaugural address would be able to be in the unfinished Senate chamber of the capital of the United States. And so I provided a copy of, of my address to Samuel Harrison Smith, who was the uh, editor of the National Intelligencer, which was a, a newspaper in Washington, D.C. that was generally supportive of my politics and my administration. In February 2021, we spoke with President Jefferson about rebellion in America, specifically Shays' Rebellion, and he responded to a question sent in by a listener. I was in Paris when all of this occurred, so I, my my understanding of it may be uh, at some detachment. But I, as I understood it, there were some significant economic dislocations uh, 
uh, and disruptions that came from the war and the aftermath of the war, and that the farmers of Western Massachusetts were unable to pay their bills, to 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 pay for services, to pay for seed, uh, or to um, pay their mortgages, and that this was the spark of an agrarian rebellion in the Western parts of that state. Is is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. He quotes a letter that you wrote, a very famous letter that you wrote, your Tree of Liberty letter that you wrote to Mr. Madison. And he says of Shays Rebellion, Jefferson wrote, I say nothing of its motives. They were founded in ignorance, not wickedness. What country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. Indeed, I I stand by that letter. The important thing to remember is that liberty, the rights of man, are the most important thing, and that we enter into a government so that it will stay out of our way as much as possible, but be an arbitrator in certain disputes and provide certain very limited and specifically enumerated services for a constitution which we have ratified, that we have explicitly endorsed. And so I believe in the consent of the governed. And when a government like the one in Massachusetts ceases to be sensitive to the needs of its citizens, those citizens should remonstrate, they should petition, they should send letters to their uh, state legislators or the governor, they should march in the capital of their state if necessary. You know, they have a right to insist that a government that they helped to create is responsive to their needs. And if that government proves to be indifferent to their concerns or hostile to their concerns, then the people need to up the ante a bit and perhaps uh, very carefully move towards a more strenuous level of protest. And, and from time to time, this will break out into armed rebellion that may be an exaggeration, pitchforks and torches and maybe some tarring and feathering or some bullying and intimidation, maybe the, the, the barricading of a, of a courthouse uh, or, or the uh, intimidation of a, of a judge or a justice of the peace. I'm not in favor of, of violence ever, of course, but there are times when it's necessary. And so rather than join the, the chorus in America of people condemning this as as mobocracy and chaos and mob action and violence and pandemonium and the end of civilization as we know it, I chose another path and said, well, obviously we're not friendly to violence and, and we, we like peaceful adjustment of, of human differences. But there are times when these things happen, I admitted that the people might be ignorant or not in full possession of the facts, but we shouldn't overreact to these rebellions. And and I even believe that in a certain way, if you take the long view, say, from Mars or Jupiter, a little rebellion now and then is not such a bad thing. It reminds government that government exists to serve us. It puts government on warning that the people are strong, and if necessary, they will engage in the same sort of revolutionary action that we all find so acceptable for the 13 colonies in 1775 and 1776 and through the course of the Revolutionary War. We, we regard that as a heroic moment in the history of man. Well, Daniel Shays certainly didn't think that he was some sort of a, a, a nihilist or a mere rabble rouser. Presumably he had an important point of view. It would be worth our knowing what that point of view is before we condemn him out of hand or, or repress that rebellion. Uh, you wrote, sir, If they remain quiet under such misconceptions, it is lethargy, the forerunner of death to public liberty. I say again, lethargy is the forerunner to the death of public liberty. So I I cannot tell you whether the events that you speak of on January 6th in your era were just or unjust, but I can tell you this, that Daniel Shays had a point of view. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour this week, a retrospective show looking back at some of our favorite conversations from 2021. And many of those favorite conversations involved Professor Joseph Ellis. You know what? Once Joe gets started, and I find him so very fascinating, and I love to just tee up a little question for him and watch him hit triples and 
home runs over and over and over again. Yeah, here's some, an excerpt from a show from February 2021 titled Argument is the Answer. Right. I, I would like to ad- embrace what I strongly believe, and I think Clay and David will both agree, it is a Jeffersonian principle that I'm embracing here, that uh, American presidential elections ought to be thoroughly democratic. That means no electoral college. Madison and Jefferson both indicated their surprise that this thing called the electoral college was adopted soon afterwards in 1787 and correspondence, and we should have done away with this thing a century ago. In the debates over the presidency and how to elect the president, they began by thinking it shouldn't be one person, it should be three people, because they were afraid of a monarch. And the sooner we do this, the better off we'll all be. Agreed to that, especially now that we have the technologies that enable us to get those results more or less instantaneously. That was the big concern back then. So, Joe, That gives me a chance to open the door to my first question for today. I'm teaching this online course on the U.S. Constitution. So if we look at the system, um, first of all, if Jefferson and Adams weren't there, uh, afterwards, I think Adams found less to dislike than Jefferson. Jefferson was pretty uh, critical of the Constitution. He actually suggested to Madison that it was a nice first draft. They might want to go back and and rethink some things and refine what they had done based upon the reactions they were getting from the 13 states. Madison didn't find that very amusing. But I think in the long run, Adams was was happier with the result than Jefferson was, although Jefferson is the great champion of a Bill of Rights, and he helped to... That's co- what, yeah, I was going to say, Clay, that's... Jefferson was concerned much more about a Bill of Rights than the Constitution itself, and he said that the failure to provide a Bill of Rights in the document itself was a fatal failure. And that's what he, in his letters with Madison, he kept, that's what he kept saying. Jefferson was right. The Bill of Rights is an incalculably more important document, in my view, than the Constitution itself. It's one of the greatest achievements of humankind, I believe. And I, not that Madison might not have done it otherwise, but Jefferson was a very strong, persuasive force. You know, he said things pretty absolutely. He said, uh, what every people on earth has a right to expect against its government is a Bill of Rights. And then he said, this can never be left to inference. It has to be spelled out in plain English. Uh, do you have any sense of how Adams reacted to the document when he finally read it? I think that he was worried that it gave the, the executive branch would become too weak. And But I think you're right. The difference between them is fundamental, though, Clay, for the reasons that you've just articulated implicitly. The Bill of Rights is a statement of the things the federal government cannot do. Jefferson always believed that we shouldn't have fundamentally replaced the Articles of Confederation. We should have revised them, maybe given the federal government some power over foreign policy. Taxation. It overdid what it was supposed to do. And he's right about that. They didn't really have the authority to do in Philadelphia what they did. Jefferson believed we were and always would be a confederation of sovereign states. Adams embraced the notion, which Madison at the time also argued for, and so did Washington, that the Constitution created a nation, not a confederation. A, with a federal government that did have power over domestic policy as well as foreign policy. And that's a fundamental difference between them. David, I know you have a question. Well, actually, I have a question from a listener, um, Jeffrey Charney, and he's asking about uh, political parties and how that's really not mentioned in the Constitution. They didn't anticipate it, or maybe they did, but n- nowadays how uh, members of Congress tend to vote along party lines, and that wasn't really anticipated and is almost unconstitutional. I'd love to hear from both of you about that. Nobody anticipated political parties, and the term political party was an epithet. They thought of parties much in the way that we now think of lobbyists, as people that intrude into the political process in ways that are partisan and uh, disruptive and usually dangerous. 
Jefferson felt this as strongly as anybody, and Clay will recognize the quote I'm about to give. Jefferson said, if I must go to heaven in a political party, I prefer not to go at all. But parties are coming into existence in the 1790s. Jefferson becomes the spiritual leader of what becomes the Republican Party, the first opposition party. But he could pass a lie detector test on saying that he has not done that. Well, I agree with you. Uh, but, you know, part of my understanding of this comes from a, a book I once read by a professor from the East Coast called um, American Sphinx. And in, <laughs> and in it, he, this guy ar argues that Jefferson could wall off separate parts of his consciousness and, and keep them from talking to each other to the point that he actually came to believe that these things were not integrated. And so that's a key insight. And that is an excerpt from an episode titled Argument is the Answer with Joseph Ellis. The book Clay is referring to, of course, is American Sphinx, which was written by Joe Ellis and received the National Book Award. In March, President Jefferson returned in a program titled Sedition Act. The conversation was brought on by a letter from a listener. A letter from a man named Doug Stein about the Sedition Act of 1798. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a long time ago, but it's a very, very important subject. And the question is, under what conditions can officials censor or coerce free expression uh, by American citizens. Let's take a listen to what Mr. Jefferson had to say. He begins by answering a question about where people get their news. If people take all of their news from one source with a particular political outlook, that's not a question of censorship. That's a question of choice. And I would say that's a bad choice. In my time, there were partisan newspapers. In fact, there was no differentiation between the, the editorial policies of the newspapers and their attempts to report the news. Everything was an opinion piece. Everything was an op-ed piece. And the bias, either Federalist or Anti-Federalist, either Federalist or Republican, was clear to any reader. And so somebody who really wishes to be informed should not only read uh, the news from his own political perspective, but also that of the other approach. Because in a republic, it's really important that we respect those we disagree with. You know, we may disagree powerfully, passionately, sometimes even in anger. But at the end of the day, we share more than what separates us. And it's important that we realize, as I said in my first inaugural address on March 4th, 181, that every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. But I would never have contented myself with only reading pro-Jefferson or pro-Republican newspapers that would not have put me in touch with a large percentage of the American people who viewed the world quite differently from myself. As I stated, Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Stein asked specifically about the Sedition Act, which was really considered the first true test of free speech. In fact, citizens could be imprisoned for simply expressing their political opinions. Yes, it was worthy of the ninth or 10th centuries. It was a fundamental violation of the Bill of Rights. Here we were just a few years into our national experiment. We had our first international crisis, the, the Quasi War between the United States and one portion of revolutionary France. I think my um, predecessor, John Adams, panicked. Uh, he gave a very warlike speech to Congress. Uh, he called for the mobilization of the American people and a great number of troops, uh, an expanded Navy. Um, uh, he broke the budget in order to pay for all of this. And it seemed to me that that was a terrible mistake, that a careful negotiation would have resolved the differences between ourselves and France. Uh, this overreaction then led to the passage of, of several laws which were appalling. Uh, the alien law, the sedition law, and the two naturalization laws. The naturalization laws expanded from five to 14 years, the amount of time you needed to be in this country to become an American citizen. This effectively uh, prevented uh, new immigrants from uh, the full rights of, of American citizenship. And the alien law enabled the 
executive to expel from this country, to banish from the United States anyone who was foreign-born and regarded as a significant security threat, and this without due process. And then finally, the odious sedition law uh, made it a crime to criticize uh, the administration of John Adams, to criticize the government of the United States. And this was used in a very draconian fashion. Uh, one person was, was jailed for uh, celebrating at a maypole, of all things, and the most bland uh, and innocuous criticisms of the way John Adams was uh, attending foreign affairs were regarded as seditious speech and people, good people, people who were essentially just good patriots were thrown into prison over this arbitrarily and without uh, due process. When I became the third president of the United States in March of 1801, I released from prison all of those who were still being incarcerated under the sedition law, and where possible, I remitted their fines. In April, Mr. Jefferson returned in time for us to wish him a happy birthday, and he shared his vision for America. I am pleased to be here, sir. If I may, Mr. Jefferson, I'd like to begin this conversation, sir, by wishing you a happy birthday this month. Ah, uh, sir, I didn't really take much time to celebrate my birthday. You know, everyone is born on such and such an occasion. It's arbitrary. I mean, we know that the gestation period for humans is about nine months, but nobody can determine the date of his birth, and there's nothing particularly interesting about it. Everyone has to be born, and that date exists somewhere on the calendar. But it is true uh, that I was born under the old calendar on April 2nd, uh, 1743. This was the Julian calendar that dated all the way back to Julius Caesar uh, at the end of the Roman Republic. And that calendar had been the most accurate ever produced up till its time, but it was imprecise. And it wasn't until the 16th century, so 1600 years later, uh, that uh, Pope Gregory put together a commission to refine the calendar. And that reform known as the Gregorian reform or the Gregorian calendar had been in operation on the continent for well more than a century. The last country in Europe to adopt the new Gregorian calendar was England because it was a Protestant country and it regarded the Gregorian reforms as somehow papist or somehow tainted by Roman Catholic theology and politics. So England was late in coming to the Reform the, the Gregorian calendar, by the way, is a superb uh, improvement upon the Julian calendar. And it wasn't until 1750, so a number of years into my life, I was born in 1743, that Britain finally adopted the new calendar, but it wasn't actually put into place until 1752. Uh, the most recent American president to recognize your birthday was President George W. Bush, who issued a proclamation number 8124 on April 11, 2007, and he stated that on Thomas Jefferson Day, we commemorate the birthday of a monumental figure whose place in our nation's history will always be cherished. Well, that's a very pleasant thing for him to have said. I don't know whether I'm monumental. I'm important because I was the penman of the Declaration of Independence, that's certain. And if I hadn't done it, somebody else would have. There was going to be an independence movement. We were going to resolve to separate from Great Britain, and somebody at the Second Continental Congress would have had to write that document, and there were a very large number of able people who could have done a, a good job with it. But I will admit that the language, the prose style, the rhetoric, uh, the argumentation that I brought to that document gave it a special luster, and so I am hesitatingly willing to say that that's a reason perhaps for my importance historically. Then I became the president of the United States between 1801 and 189. That wasn't particularly important, although it brought about the Louisiana Purchase in 183, which doubled the size of the country. But I suppose what's important in my presidency is that I toned it down. You know, my, my predecessors were really moving into sort of a quasi-monarchical style and moving, I think, rapidly towards um, aping British ceremonials and British pomp uh, 
and circumstance. And so by walking to my inauguration and greeting people at the door, myself as president and and corresponding regularly with, with regular Americans and so on, uh, and, and not least by reducing the national debt by 37%, I played a minor role, I think, in the history of the country. But I would add one more thing to my own achievement if I must reflect upon my own life in this way, and, and that is that I wrote the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, and that document uh, separated church and state in Virginia, and by implication began the process of separating church and state throughout uh, the United States, and, and declared that a person's religious sensibilities are no business of government, that government has no right under any circumstances to intrude upon an individual's freedom of conscience, that that's something between himself and his pastor, between himself and his God, uh, between himself and his conscience, but not between himself and his government. And that, I believe, is probably my most important achievement in life. Uh, so I will uh, say that in those three ways, perhaps, and I suppose I could add that I played a minor role in helping to establish neoclassical architecture for our state buildings in this country, and I gave us the decimal coinage system that we still use now, and I had a plan for the development of the Western territories by way of new states um, and so on. That could be added to this list, but I think that my importance is not that I was born and certainly not that I was president. My importance is that I was a creative, rational designer for a new type of Republican system of government. Sir, this week we have wished you a happy birthday. We have noted that it is a nationally recognized day. I thought perhaps in the remaining time of our conversation, we might talk about your vision for America. I have a good friend who uses the phrase Jeffersonian Song of America. In other words, men who aspire to positions of leadership need to know how to sing the Jeffersonian Song of America, of optimism. Could you talk about your vision for America, sir? I can, uh, it, but it isn't necessarily a, a, a political vision. It's, it's more an understanding of what America means. The New World wasn't really discovered, the Western Hemisphere, until the late 15th century. You know, we, th we think of 1492 and Columbus. And although we are aware that, that that might not have been the first contact from the Old World to the New, it was the first important contact. And so beginning in the 16th century, Europeans began to come to uh, the north and south portions of America and to build tentative colonies like Jamestown and, and Plymouth and, and uh, Roanoke and so on. And here we were, and we looked to the west and saw infinite land, you know. And we didn't even know how far it was. All we knew was that there, it, was, it was gigantic, it was colossal when you realize that we had an uh, unprecedented amount of open land uh, with all of its fertility intact. And so how can you not be an optimist when you have that? In, in any people on earth, had you said to them, write a utopian novel about infinite possibility, they would have had to define what became America. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour and our look back at some of our favorite conversations from 2021. And many of those favorite conversations involved a brilliant woman, Lindsay Chervinsky. What an extraordinary young woman. You know, uh, about a year ago, I saw just in a routine search in a bookstore, her first book, The Cabinet, about George Washington's creation of our cabinet system of government during the, his first term as president. And so I ordered and read the book, thought it was um, a remarkable study uh, and very useful to me as a Jefferson scholar uh, and a presidential historian. And so we contacted her and asked her if she might like to be on the Jefferson Hour. She graciously agreed to do it. People liked her. We loved her. She is uh, fun, funny, uh, has a great sense of humor. But what's most interesting, I think, is that she brings such fresh eyes to this that she admitted or declared that she is not one of those people who thinks of the founding fathers with kind of a deep reverence and a bow. She looks on them as extraordinary human beings who had the strengths and weaknesses of human beings. 
and that she's not caught up in the illusion, the kind of that old misty founding father's illusion that most of us uh, grew up with. And I think that's an extremely important new lens on all of this. This is an excerpt from show 1447, The History of D.C. Let's take a listen. Welcome back, Lindsay, and so good to have you here with us. Well, thank you guys so much for having me back. It's great to be here. We appreciate your being a guest here on the Thomas Jefferson Hour. So I want to ask you a question about the national capital of the United States. And we all hear about the great dinner party that Jefferson hosted, and Hamilton was there wanting his funding um, package to be passed, and Madison was there because he didn't like Hamilton's funding package. And during the course of this dinner, that a that a bargain was created, a trade, a quid pro quo, and that uh, Madison reluctantly decided to support the funding mechanisms of Alexander Hamilton's fiscal plan in exchange for Hamilton convincing some Northerners to accept the placement of the national capital on the Potomac. And therefore, we got uh, Washington, D.C. in due time. How reliable is this story, do you think? That's such a good place to start the conversation. My guess is, like with a lot of things that Jefferson wrote about, there is certainly a large helping of truth to it. There's probably a little bit more nuance than than he lets on. Um, unfortunately for us in the 21st century, that's really the only record we have of that conversation. So we kind of have to take his word for it. But I usually encourage people to take it with sort of a bucket of salt, um, given you know when he's sort of writing this reflection. But I think that the dinner itself, even if he's sort of embellishing what happens here, the idea behind it and the compromise that he's discussing is absolutely accurate. And the, I mean, I think it would be helpful at some point if we do talk about sort of why there needed to be a federal capital, but the background for that sort of where it should be had a lot to do with what sort of social, economic, cultural influences would reign supreme over the federal city. And so if it was in a place like New York City, then of course commerce and trade and the merchant interests would be sort of front and center. But if it was in a more pastoral scene, a little bit farther west and maybe a little bit farther south, Southerners were likely to have more influence and sort of the human farmer interest would be more front and center. And so that compromise between Hamilton's financial plans and a more rural setting is very literally a compromise between these two ideas and, of course, these two men. But, you know, Jefferson says he was new. He had been in France for five years. He's now in the national capital in New York, and he sees this haggard-looking person on the street. It turns out to be Hamilton. He's disheveled. He's melancholic. And he says that he's probably going to have to quit because it looks like his funding scheme is not going to um, be approved by the Congress. He can't understand why Madison has turned on him. And then Jefferson says, arm in arm, we walked up and down the street a couple of turns. (laughs) Maybe there's something that I can do for you. And so Jefferson... It's just such a beautiful Jefferson story, even if it's not 100% true. Hamilton and Jefferson certainly knew each other, but there's not a whole lot of reason to suggest that Hamilton would confide in Jefferson over anyone else. But there is no doubt that this dinner took place and there's no doubt that the compromise took place. So certainly some of that happened. And as we discussed last time, Jefferson did have beautiful manners when he wanted to have beautiful manners. So I have no doubt that he facilitated those negotiations. Whether he was ever arm in arm with Hamilton is a little bit hard to hard to believe. What if this hadn't happened? What if Hamilton had gotten his fiscal scheme without this compromise and the capital had wound up in Philadelphia? That's a big question. Um, so I think the the largest implication would be the role of slavery, because by the 1790s, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania had laws on the books that required gradual manumission or for people who were bringing their enslaved individuals into the city, they were um, automatically manumitted after six months. So you are not going to have Um, markets where people are selling their enslaved individuals a few feet from the capital. You are not going to have um, jails where runaway enslaved individuals are being held. You are not going to have that type of um, very pervasive element of slavery in the day-to-day life in the national city like you do once it becomes Washington, D.C. And 
we should absolutely talk about the role of slavery in Washington, D.C., because it is a very unique element to the city and the national story. And D.C. plays sort of this weird pivot point for a lot of the debate over this issue. But now that we are so attuned to seeing race everywhere, isn't it possible that behind all that screen of Virgil and pastoralism, there was a protection of the Southern institution of slavery, that these people wanted to make sure that no one could really mess with slavery and that the closer the capital got to Virginia, the more likely they were able to resist any embarrassment over slavery? It's a powerful question. Um, I don't think that Jefferson necessarily was focused on that per se, but I have no doubt that that was a factor for other Southerners. But we've been for so long wearing blinders. I mean, really, for most of American yeah. history, we have whitewashed this set of stories. Yeah. And now that we have really become intense about this, there's disillusionment in every direction when you realize how the Constitutional Convention reached impasses and made compromises with the Deep South that had profound negative implications for all of American history to this day, and how the South really held the rest of the country hostage. If you mess with slavery in any significant way, we'll walk and there'll be no union, and they acquiesced. And in the Declaration of Independence, Jefferson had that anti-slave trade manifesto, and he it was expunged, as he says, at the insistence of the Carolinas and Georgia. And, uh, you know, the three-fifths clause, the Electoral College, some people say the Second Amendment, but it turns out behind all of this, there is this, this subterranean, and not always even subterranean, dynamics of race and the protection of slavery. And it when I, when I look at this, having spent decades thinking about these questions, I feel ashamed that I was so uh, naive and I also feel so sullied in a way that the mythology of America's founding doesn't really stand up very well to deep scrutiny. I actually think that it's, I was listening to your conversation with Joe Ellis, one of your more recent ones, and I actually wanted to take the opportunity to commend you because there are a lot of people who have been studying this issue for a really long time and they don't want to rethink their previous approaches and their previous considerations or even changes in the language. They're very uncomfortable when people start to change the language that we now consider to be appropriate. And if anything, I think that it's a gift that you have the ability to rethink some of your ideas, to share new history, and to encourage others to do so. And I think that's actually a really great thing. That was Lindsay Chervinsky. In November, we recorded a program called In at Meander, and we had a chance to catch up with three of our favorite contributors, Pat Brodowski, Bo Wright, and Brad Krizzler. I love these people. You know, Pat is one of the most lovely and life-affirming people that I've ever met in my life. She's been exceedingly good to us. She's sent seeds. She's welcomed uh, in her former role as the head gardener at Monticello, Friends of the Jefferson Hour. They come and mention the show, and she represents the Jeffersonian. Bo Wright is that kind of golden youth who believes in public service. Uh, and I think a, an insider's understanding of what goes on in Washington. And then Chrysler, you know, he's he's a modest man, but he is something of a Renaissance man. You know, his interests are varied, whip smart. He's, he's really something. And so these are people who listen to the program. They have things to say. They bring a different perspective from the one that I bear and the one that you bear. So everybody who is a correspondent brings something to the program. I think this is a good time, given the rancor that is percolating in American national political circles, for us to step back and, and just say, God bless this country. God bless uh, what, what we have here. Yes, and bless our contributors. We're so grateful for those of you who have taken time to write the show this year and support the show, and also the people that have appeared on the show, Russ Eagle, uh, Pat Brodowski, David Nicandri, Bo Wright, Brad Chrysler, and of course, Lindsay Chervinsky and Joe Ellis. In November this year, we did a show called In at Meander, and during that show, we had a chance to speak to 
three of our regular contributors, and I'm going to play some excerpts from that now. This is Bo Wright. Well, it's so good to talk with both of you. Uh, it's been a long time, but as an avid Thomas Jefferson Hour listener, um, I just want to thank you and congratulate you on a, on a string of just really wonderful shows um, over the past several months. So, so thank you. Um, I read a pretty alarming statistic this week, which is that the middle 60 percent of the country now has less wealth than the top one percent, which is a pretty staggering statistic, which means, I think, then, that a lot of people are being left out. And that's where a lot of the discontent in red states and blue states is originating um, from, I think, this this feeling of being left behind. Goodness, Bo, I just, I, I, I called to have us wish each other a happy holiday <laughs> season, and, and I've taken the two of you to the end of the republic. I know that you have some important meetings to go to this morning, and I'm so grateful that you took a few minutes to talk to us, but I will give you the last word, sir. Oh, you're very kind. Well, it's, it's just, it's always refreshing to both listen to you all and then a great joy to speak with you. Um, I wish you both, and of course, all of uh, the Thomas Jefferson Hour listeners, a very peaceful and meaningful Thanksgiving, and I hope that we can all approach uh, our dining room tables with a measure of goodwill um, and hopefully a little less politics uh, this Thanksgiving. Bo, stay strong, stay healthy, and uh, keep talking to us, will you? Hey, you all do the same. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks much. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Shall we talk to Pat? A couple of years ago, we did a program with a man who is trying to bring back the tomato. And why is it, Pat, that we American consumers are willing to eat bad tomatoes, bad strawberries, et cetera. Well, you've hit right on it. It's the shipping. If you have to be able to ship something and not have it bruise. And so if you want to have a perfectly ripe strawberry, you better go back out in your backyard and pick it. Um, no, it's like it's the demand of having things available every season of the year rather than seasonal and regional. And we really need to get back to the seasonal regional focus. You're a wonderful and I think understated exemplar of this movement, this movement to know your food, to know where it was produced, to uh, bring it locally if possible. And here's my question. I know this exists as a movement in the country, but do you see in your lifetime or your daughter's lifetime the U.S. getting more serious and this not being a interesting minority movement, but becoming a new way of seeing our food supply. In my lifetime, I've seen a lot of change. And I bet you have too, because in my lifetime, uh, we moved from like having these hippie co-ops to uh, farmers markets everywhere that are really nice. And the CSA movement is a community supported agriculture where families sign up to have you know, their regional food um, available every week. It's it's really um, amazing. And the amount of organic produce, and um, it's much, much better than when I was a kid going to the grocery store. Um, I grew up in a family that we grew most of our food. It wasn't a lot purchased. But today, I think more is available if you search for it, if you demand for it. And even Walmart has organic produce um, here and there. So. And finally, we come to Brad Crisler, who I like to refer to as the conscience of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Brad is an incredibly successful songwriter who has recently taken an early retirement from that profession. I spent 30 years as a uh, professional songwriter, producer. I'm, as you guys know, I'm from Alabama, from Muscle Shoals, and uh, I just had a great career. But the thing we all love about Jefferson and, and the reason I've always connected to Jefferson, he's a five on the Enneagram, which means he is uh, what's known as the investigator. He is endlessly curious about the world around him and, uh, and it isn't just satisfied, was never satisfied with being passively or nominally involved in the subject. He voraciously surrounded it and consumed it and he he was as we know a, a true renaissance man in the american sense and was uh, able to hold conversations 
uh, about so many different topics. That is something I try to model my life after. In fact, it comes intuitively. Those who are, of us who are wired that way just can't help be that way. And uh, I feel like Jefferson was a uh, the perfect model for that, the perfect embodiment of the curious um, enlightenment figure. Uh, that's why I love him. That has kind of been, you know, something I've t- taken seriously in my life. And I still do lots of music. Every single day I get up and walk into the studio and turn stuff on and I'm just kind of amazed by the possibilities, uh, the ability to make music that I don't owe anyone. Uh, that, you know, is not for another artist or a project, just music to be made simply for the purpose of getting better at it. And that's something I've kind of rediscovered in my retirement. And uh, I love, love doing it. I create music every day. You got to be careful about that word retirement. You're pretty young for that, Brad. <laughs> well, it's uh, retirement from commercial music business is what I, you know, I'm referring to. Obviously, I've hopefully many years to, to discover and, and uh, become knowledgeable about thing, other things I'm passionate about and continue to, uh, to study and be fascinated by the, the American Sphinx, Thomas Jefferson. Indeed. And with that, all of us at the Thomas Jefferson Hour wish all of you a very happy and prosperous and healthy new year. Please join us next week for another important edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. <laughs>